A few years ago, I bought a John Deere ride-on lawnmower. Uh, my old one still worked fine, but it was cutting unevenly. So I wanted somebody to haul it away, so I listed it on Craigslist for $100. Within 15 minutes, literally, six people had inquired. And it was like a stampede. Who could get out to my house fat first to, to pick it up? I realized I'd seriously underpriced it. For a Scottish guy, that was a tough moment. Uh, but at least I accomplished what I wanted. Somebody hauled it away, and I had a crisp $100 bill in my wallet. Maybe you've had a similar experience. You sold something, and you realized you could have gotten far more for it. Or you hadn't done a sport for a while, and then you tried it, and you realized, you know, that was fun. I'm, I'm better than I thought I would be. Or you went to a function, and uh, you didn't really want to go, but once you got there, you had a great time. Or maybe a friend invited you to church, and you told him you'd come today, and, but you've been dreading it. But now that you're here, you say, you know, this isn't so bad. I think that's the way it is with our relationship with God. I think we all naturally put God off. We want to run our own lives and don't want God telling us what to do. We kind of think if we get close to God, He's going to kind of destroy our fun. Even if you've given your life to Christ, maybe you don't ask Him for much because you think He won't give it to you. You don't ask Him to change much that's going on in your life because you're not aware that God wants to do far more for you than you really understand. The Apostle Paul, in one of his most famous verses, says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. God wants to do more. We're made for more. Our purpose is to, read this with me, be disciples who make disciples who make disciples, who take the fullness of Christ into every corner of the world. Now, we live in a great place to live out that purpose, to make disciples. Over 50% of people in the Portland metropolitan area have no religious affiliation whatsoever. 95, 90% of the people that live in Portland only go to church once or twice a year. The vast majority of those never go at all. Outreach magazine called Portland, they say Portland is the post-Christian frontier. Portland is about 20 years ahead of most U.S. cities in the United States in terms of secularization, and we're about 20 years behind Europe. How do we follow Jesus in Portland in such a way that we not only survive, but we thrive? How do we not go the way of Scandinavia or France or Spain? How do we stay robust in our faith? Post-Christian doesn't mean that you've just moved on from Christ. It means you're antagonistic against Christ, like a rebellious teenager. When somebody asks me, what do you do for work? I, I think to myself, oh, here we go again. When I tell them I'm a pastor, I'm pretty sure it's not going to just be, oh, that's interesting. It's going to be actually a visceral, negative reaction. Walls will go up. So I'm tempted to want to tell them I run a nonprofit that serves the community. In post-Christian culture, even when people are not antagonistic against Christ, you're likely to get responses like, oh, I've never met a Christian before. You aren't unicorns. You actually exist. Uh, Jamie are, uh, is a senior at Portland State, and uh, over the eight years that we've led Portland Community Church, she has brought a lot of friends to church. And the one thing most of them have in common is that they've never 
been to church before in their lives. We have thousands of teenagers growing up in Portland that don't know squat about Christ. So how do we reach people in Portland? Clearly, the attractional model is not going to work. Put up a sign, open our doors, and they will come in. They will not. You can, we, can, we can say, come on this Sunday, and you get a free iPhone 10. We may give out a lot of iPhones, but they won't come back the second time. We have to pursue the missional model. We become disciples who make disciples who make disciples and take the fullness of Christ to every corner of our city, Monday through Sunday. We can't just see mission as taking the gospel to people in foreign countries. We have people in Portland who don't know anything about Christ. They've never learned anything about it. We also have people in Portland from countries around the world. We need to approach our city the same way we would to taking Christ to people in a foreign country. So how do we reach our family, our classmates, our work associates, our friends? How do we minister to people when we already feel too busy? Nine out of ten Americans say they are over busy. Exhaustion is the new normal. How do we keep reaching people for Christ from just becoming one more thing in our busy schedule? How do we fuel the mission to make a difference in our city? How do we stay motivated to serve people in Portland? I think the Apostle Paul reveals the secret. Turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. If you want to use, we have Bibles under the seats. It's on page 1,174. Apostle Paul says you can't just keep pumping people up. Get out there. Take the city. You can do it. Paul says here's the secret. He offers a beautiful prayer. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. He says every family... Every people group, every person on this planet derives their name from God. We are all created by God. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. And now here comes the secret. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You read about that love which God has for us and you say, sign me up. We find the strength We discover the energy to take the fullness of Christ to everyone we know by experiencing the love of God. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, think of a tree with its roots going deep into the soil, drawing nutrients so that it can produce fruit. No tree strains to produce fruit. Mm, We've got to push it out. No, a tree produces fruit naturally. And may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. When we drench ourselves in the love of Christ, we find the motivation that will sustain us. When we realize how much God loves us, we get filled up to fullness with Him so that we're able to love others. Paul says, I want you to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. His love is so big. 
I remember with all of our nine children growing up, playing this little game with them. I particularly remember playing it with our fifth son, Mark. Mark was getting bigger, kind of going through a growth spirit, and I say, Mark, you're getting so big. Then I'd ask the question, how big is Mark? And he'd answer, so big. And I say, yeah, so big. Now, if Jory tries on a new dress for me and I say, so, you know, she says, how is it? And I say, so big. That's not going to work quite so well. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When we bask in how much God loves us, we're filled with the fullness of Christ. And with that, we can take that to other people we know. Everyone who experiences the love of God has an endless supply of motivation to love people. We don't try to reach people out of guilt, but out of love. We shift from more guilt to more love. We don't guilt people into serving at McKay or serving in the church or reaching out to their friends in the community. We help them rest in the love of God, how much He loves them. And out of that, they have plenty of love for people. We fuel the mission of God with an experience of the love of God. Amy Wells knew that her bridal shop would be busy the three days after Thanksgiving. It was always that way. People would use the, the holiday to go out and shop for wedding dresses. She was ready to serve them. What she didn't realize is that she would be providing love to a dying man. Jack Autry, uh, in the same town, San Antonio, uh, was dying of melanoma, cancer. Two days before, he had collapsed, and they rushed him to the emergency room. The family had all gathered, not just for Thanksgiving, but to help his daughter prepare for her wedding, which is just months away. The plan was that Chrysalis, who was getting married, and her mother and her mother-in-law-to-be and her sisters would all go out the day after Thanksgiving to shop for a wedding dress. But with her dad in the hospital, Chrysalis didn't want to go. Jack insisted. And so with much persuasion, she and her mother, mother-in-law, and sisters went to look for a gown. Amy saw them as they came in. They seemed a bit subdued. She figured they were just a quiet family. She helped Chrysalis try on dress after dress, and finally she found the perfect one. Her dad used to tell her that he was, she was his princess, and as she looked in the mirror, she said, I think I do look like a princess. That's when Amy looked, learned about her dad, Jack Autry. Because he was so sick, he couldn't come and see Amy in her new dress. Because of medical bills, they wouldn't be able to buy the dress that day. In fact, her dad would probably die without ever seeing her in her wedding dress. Well, Amy would have nothing to do with that. You said, you, t you take the dress right now and go to the hospital and put it on for your dad. She just said, you know, I felt like it was the right thing to do. I felt like God was telling me. She didn't take credit card information. She didn't even take a cell phone. Well, Chrysalis didn't need any convincing, and so she went, and they got to the hospital, and her dad was heavily medicated and asleep, and while the family woke him up, the doors opened, and Chrysalis came in in her wedding gown. He opened his eyes. He smiled at her, and she came over, and she took his hand, and he took hers, and she said, Daddy, do I look like a princess? He shook his head. Then he closed his eyes and he went back to sleep. 
Three days later, he died. Amy was able to provide an experience of cascading love of God from God to her to Chrysalis to her dad. And that's how it works. You experience the love of God and you're able to pass it on to somebody else. You understand how much God loves you, and then you take that fullness of God to other people everywhere you go. Paul says in one of his most famous verses, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us. This verse is so popular, people will sit for an hour just to hear the pastor say it. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Every Christ follower is called to, read this with me again, be a disciple who makes disciples, who make disciples, who carry the fullness of Christ to every corner of the world. That's our common calling. Then each of us has an individual calling, a special calling, specific way God wants to use us in this world. Our individual calling is at the intersection of our gifts, passions, and story. GPS. Think of it, global positioning system. But in this case, it's gifts, passions, story. Maybe you were abused sexually as a young girl. That's your story. Your passion is to help other young women overcome that trauma. When Jory was born, her mother gave her up for adoption. Her mother was only 18. She was too young to take care of her and realize that. So she gave her up to Illinois Adoptive Services. And Jory was adopted into a wonderful family, wonderful mom and dad. She had a great experience with that. So that's her story. She was born an orphan, and that's her passion. And so she's been able to help over a 1,000 families adopt a child into their home. And she serves orphans in Vietnam and Kenya. The international definition of an orphan is a child has no parents or one parent. I think practically all the families in Vietnam have no parents, and many of the families in Kenya have no parents or one parent. Apostle Paul tells his story in Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. When Paul became a Christian, he suffered a lot. He wrote most of his letters in the New Testament, from prison. And because he suffered so much, he writes a lot about suffering. It's one of the main topics he's known for. Because he suffered, he could help you with difficulties you're facing. And then he tells us about his passion. For the sake of you Gentiles. Paul was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. So a Jew among Jews. But God chose him to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That was his passion. And then he tells us about his gifting. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ, God, by his grace, gives you a gift, a spiritual gift or several spiritual gifts to use in his service at your work, at your school, in your neighborhood, in your family, in the church was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. God called Paul to be an apostle. There were the 11 disciples remaining after Judas died, we all became apostles, and then Paul. 
He was uh, called to be an apostle to plant churches among the Gentiles and to oversee these churches. We're all called to make disciples who in turn make more disciples, but we each have our specialties. For all of us, it's the same. We fuel the mission of God with an experience of the love of God. We bask in God's love, and that gives us more than enough motivation and energy to serve people. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, this is one of his most famous lines, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Most of us who admit that we're tired, we're exhausted, we're too busy. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, come to me, experience my rest. Enjoy me. Know how much I love you. And out of that, you'll have all the motivation and enthusiasm you need to serve people and tell people about me. Eugene Peterson in the message writes it this way. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. As a pastor, I often get tired. I sometimes think, I hope all the people aren't as tired as I am. I know that as the leader goes, so goes the church. I want to experience Christ's rest and His peace, His serenity in the midst of a busy life. I want to experience His love, and then I want to exhibit that to all of you. And that's my invitation to you today. Come to Christ. Experience His rest. Experience His love, how much He loves you. That will give you all the motivation you need to serve people and to tell people about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us, that you died on the cross for us. Thank you for your rest, that you offer us peace in the midst of tumult. And we want to experience your rest and your love this week. And out of that, have all the strength and energy and motivation we need to serve other people, our families our friends, and tell them about you. You want to tell Jesus that today? I'll give you a minute just to pray and tell him that. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you can just invite him into your life. Ask him to fill you with your, his love. You pray right now.